All right, let's get started. Good to see everybody again. Hi, it's uh, week five. We're almost halfway done. And uh, this week, we are going to learn a new concept called pointers. And uh, also, we're going to learn how to implement a linked list. So uh, we're going to start into a unit of material that will span several weeks where we're going to learn about how a lot of collections are built on the inside. And primarily, we're going to learn how that's done by doing it ourselves, by re-implementing, like, how does a hash set work? And how does a map work? And how does a vector work? And all these different things. Um, we're going to learn about that in detail and implement some of them ourselves. So that's, that's the plan. Uh, we'll do that for the next, what, one, two, two or three weeks at least. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and uh, in terms of the big picture, last Friday, homework four went up, which is about backtracking. It's due early next week. Um, and your midterm is late next week. Practice exam materials will go up in the next day or two for the midterm, okay? So that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, so let me just open my slides here to pointers. And I will say, <clears throat> the topic for today is primarily going to be about this concept of pointers. But, you know, and in my experience, whenever I teach this lecture, students have like a bunch of questions about pointers. Kind of like in week one, there were a ton of interesting questions about C++ syntax and stuff. And um, that's great, but really this feature is a vehicle that I want to use so that we can learn how to implement a linked list. So pointers are great and all, but I don't, you know, the, the point of this lecture isn't to like dive super deep into everything about pointers, right? In fact, if you want to do that, CS107 does a whole bunch with pointers and memory and you'll get way more pointers than you ever wanted if you take 107. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, you'll see. You guys got any friends who took 107 and they're like crying, trying to implement a memory allocator and stuff? Okay, anyway, um, yeah. So, like I said, pointers as a vehicle for implementing linked lists has come from chapter 11 and 12 of the book. So, a linked list, I talked about it really briefly a long time ago, right? It's basically the same as a vector, except instead of storing a sort of an array, a big blob of memory to handle all the elements, Instead, it has these little boxes that I call nodes. And each node stores a single element value, and then it has kind of a link to another node, and they sort of chain together. Uh, lots of instructors use visual aids, like uh, uh, train cars, or you bring in the toy, the barrel of monkeys, and you pull the little monkeys out, and they look like these little nodes holding hands and stuff. So uh, a linked list is kind of the, the first example of a structure like that. But there are other structures that use this concept of little nodes that point to each other. Uh, in fact, the map and the set that we use in our, in our libraries use a similar concepts. So we'll learn about that soon. But anyway, <clears throat> this structure has some benefits relative to an array. We talked about how if you want to insert something at the front of the list, you don't have to shift elements over. You kind of just make a new box and you point arrows at things and then the new element is at the front of the list, no shifting. Of course, there are also some drawbacks to this as well. So it's some pros and some cons. Anyway, how to implement this thing? Well, these arrows that cause one box to have a connection to the next box, in C++, if you want this sort of uh, structure, you have to learn about something called pointers. Now, you know, I always think it's good to think about context. Like, what if we weren't doing this class in C++? What if it was Java? What if it was Python? Whatever. Most languages don't have pointers. Instead, they have something called references, where when you store objects, you actually store these sort of ability to reach objects in memory. So most languages have a concept kind of like this. But anyway, let's talk about pointers. Um, before I go into pointers, I want to talk about what I will use to implement these little boxes, which these are called structures or structs. They're like little objects. So I want to talk about that first. So a struct or a structure is a, uh, like a very lightweight <coughs> class. I've shown you one or two of these previously, but I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So a structure is a definition of a new data type. You write the word struct and then its name, and then in brackets you write the members that each element of that type should have. So just to be clear, this is a lot like making a class. You're saying I want to make a new type called date, and every date element, every date uh, instance or value stores a month and it stores a day. So you can say, I'm going to make a new variable called today of type date, and then I can set his dot month and his dot day. So it's just like a little single variable that stores two ints inside of it, okay? Um, that's what a struct is. 
And again, I think what some students have trouble with, maybe you guys are, are, are good on this, but what some students <coughs> struggle with is they see this and they think that you're declaring some single variable here, and that variable has a month in it and has a day in it. But it's not quite what this is. This is like a, a, a declaration of a, of a template. Like, you're saying, I want to be able to make date objects, and inside of them, they will have a month and they will have a day. So this thing, all by itself, does not create any dates. These lines create dates, and I can create as many or as few of them as I like. So that's an important distinction. So anyway, that's what a struct or structure is. Yes? Wait, so on the bottom line, where it says date x miss, and then it has the young. Um, yeah. The bracket. What if uh, in a was instead of, like, say, string event? You could say, yeah, like you could say 12, comma, quote, hello, so and it would get. You could put both different things. Uh-oh, where did I go? Where did I go? OK, there. Don't touch it. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can create a structure and initialize new elements of that structure. So OK, that's what a struct is. It's possible to write structs with like methods in them and stuff. Like uh, if you want to say days in the month, depending what the month is, you return how many days it has. You can write a two string method that returns things. And these methods can refer to these variables. So like if you make a date variable called today, and then you say today dot days in month, it uses the today objects month <coughs> and day. If you make another date object called Xmas and you call days and month on that, it will use that object's month and day. So these methods, I mean, this is stuff you probably would have seen in like a 106A type of course or an AP course. The same concept of like classes having methods that interact with the data in the class. That's the same idea here. Yes? How are structs different than classes? Right, so then how, well, isn't this just a class then? Right. Um, so, uh, slightly shortened answer. Um, somewhat, it's just convention. If you say there is such a thing as a class in C++, and the expectation when you make a class is that you're making something big with like a constructor and methods and interesting behavior, and the expectation when you make a struct is that it's some little crappy <coughs> thing. It's just a couple of ints, maybe, maybe like one method, but it's not meant to be like big, but it's just a little guy. So, but syntactically, like, what can they do? They're actually equally powerful as each other. And the only behavioral difference between a struct and a class is that, by default, everything inside of a struct is public. So you can reach into it and look at the value of its variables. Whereas with a class, things are private by default. So if you try to reach in and touch the variables, it'll say you don't have access to that. So um, anyway, why do they have both of those things that have such little difference between them in the same language? It has mostly to do with the fact that this C language, the predecessor of C++, only supported these structs. And C++ added classes. But then they went back and enhanced structs to basically be classes. Anyway, whatever. So, yeah. That sort of struct is basically a class, basically an object. In fact, all this code would be, if you just wrote the word class instead of struct, all the code would behave pretty similarly. Um, Okay, so there's a struct with some methods in it. Somebody else had their hand up. Was that the same question that you had? Okay. Um, so, look, the reason I'm showing you structs is that I want to be able to make these little uh, links of nodes that connect them to each other and stuff, right? So if you were going to make a, a type for these nodes, you'd say, well, they store some kind of data, and then they store some kind of way to get to the next node. The data is probably like an int because they store numbers in them or... You know, if it were Java, maybe you'd want something more general, like objects, you could store anything or whatever. But maybe for now, it just stores an int of data. But what's this next thing? Well, you might be tempted to say, well, I store a node that's the next node, right? Um, that's not quite right, because like, if you tried to draw a picture of the memory of a node, it would be like a little square. Oh my god, I can't draw. OK, wait. <coughs> There. So like, if the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> if, if the thing has two little compartments, like the data is the little, the little int right here, could store like a 42. If the next was a node, like if I wrote node here, then that would imply that like this little compartment right here stored another node. <laughs> and then that node had some kind of int in it. And it had a next, which was another. So it would be like this infinitely self-recursive uh, re structure or something. That's not quite right. Um, <clears throat> it's almost like, uh, you know, if you say like a person has a name and a set of friends. Well, what are their friends? Are they persons? But you don't take your friends and like stuff them inside of your body. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. But, uh, I don't know what some of you do on, on the weekends. But uh, <laughs> Are we still doing phrasing? Phrasing? Uh, 
yeah, anyway, uh, sometimes what you do, if you, if you say, oh, these are my friends, what you really store is some way of referring to them or reaching them. You store their names or you store their phone numbers or you store their address. You can go to their house or their dorm or whatever. You store a way to get to the friend, right? And so if I were to say node next, that would be incorrect here. So really what we're going to end up doing, like the node next doesn't work. What we really need is something called a pointer, which will say, uh, it's basically how do I go get to another node in the memory of the computer. That feature will allow us to chain these things together. So I'm going to jump aside for a second and talk about pointers and what they are so that then I can come back here and build linked lists with pointers, OK? <laughs> so pointers. <clears throat> oh, wait, quick question. How many of you have programmed with pointers already before? Oh, really? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Where? Like in C? Or why did you do pointers? Yes? C++? What's wrong with you people? OK, whatever. I'm assuming you have it. So if you didn't raise your hand, it's OK. I'm talking to you. So um, in C or C++, there is an operator, an ampersand operator. It's called the address of operator. If you use address of in front of a variable, it will evaluate and tell you the memory address where that variable is stored. Now, most of the time, you don't have to think about this stuff. The computer just kind of does that for you. But if you wanted to know where something was in memory, you could ask for it using this operator. So like, <clears throat> I don't often draw pictures of memory. And these pictures are not very good. But like, when you declare index 42, it sets aside some kind of piece of memory at some kind of address. Memory addresses are usually written with this funny syntax, 0x7f8. This is hexadecimal. This is just an, a number. But it's written in base 16, where every digit goes 0 through 9, and then A through F. A is 10, and F is 15. So it's like 0 through 15 for every digit place. The reason we write them that way is because you could write a bigger number with fewer characters. And it kind of lets you write these dense little memory addresses in a certain way. Also, because computers think in powers of 2 a lot, and 16 is a power of 2. So we write memory addresses like that. And 0x doesn't mean anything. It's just like saying, this is going to be a hexadecimal number. So like. You make a variable, and at some memory address, that variable gets stored, OK? If you wrote ampersand x, it would evaluate to produce that integer of that memory address where x is stored, OK? You could print the memory address and print it out, you know? Uh, I declared an int y, and I printed that. If you look carefully, the memory addresses are off from each other by 4 because an int takes 32 bits or four bytes. So a lot of times, if you declare two variables, they will happen to be at the consecutive memory addresses. Um, <clears throat> I've declared an int, uh, a date called d, and that has a memory address. A date has a month and a day and some methods and stuff. And so, the, the, bless you, the various components of the date are like stored in the memory right there. This isn't quite what it looks like, but it's close enough. So like. If you try to print the address of the month of the day or the address of the day of the day or whatever, you can see these different things in the memory using this AND operator. Okay. So, memory addresses, what can I do with them? Yeah, go ahead. So, the last three, D dot, month, D dot, A, and D, it ends up printing out D for D month, but not for D day. Oh, well, why, yeah, why is D the same as D dot month? Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is because D dot month is like decided to be the first in memory. Okay. Like if you make a struct and it has two things in it, then really it takes the memory of those two things, add it up, and the first one is there and then the second one. Mm -hmm. So like, now I don't know if this is literally how it would lay the memory out. Sometimes it depends compiler to compiler. Or some things change from system to system. Sometimes it actually goes the other way. Like the memory addresses go down the more variables you do. It's kind of weird. but but. Go take 107, right? <laughs> but anyway, yeah, the, the pieces of a struct are all just placed consecutively in the memory right next to each other. So OK, fine, you can do that. You can ask for the addresses of things. You can store a memory address in a variable. Technically, a memory address is just a number. You can store it as an int. But we think that that's considered kind of bad form. So instead, we, we create this new data type called a pointer. A pointer is a variable that's declared with an asterisk. And the way I read this is like int star p or int pointer p equals address of x. So what I'm doing is I'm storing this number, 0x, 7f, whatever. I'm storing that as a variable in p. And the type of that variable is memory address of an int or pointer to an int. Okay. Now, again, technically, 
This is just storing the number, and that number's value is 0x7, whatever, whatever, whatever. But we write this little star to say it's a memory address of an int. It's a pointer to an int. Uh, question, yeah. Uh, how much memory does a pointer take up? How much memory does a pointer take up? Uh, depends on your system. But if you have a 64-bit computer, it usually takes up 64 bits. Uh, if you have a 32-bit computer, it takes up 32 bits. In fact, often when they talk about those distinctions, you're either talking about the CPU's instruction size or you're talking about the memory address inside or both. And so, yeah, I mean, most computers now, these actually are 64-bit are pointers. I think in my examples, they're all 32-bit pointers, but none of the stuff I'm teaching depends on that in any way. So I think the, the principle generalizes. Yeah. So, so like, uh, uh, make a pointer, is it, it's always a hexadecimal? It's always a hexadecimal. Well, I mean, to the computer, they're all just numbers. The thinking of them as hexadecimal is just to help our puny brains understand things, right? Like, they're all just in, they're all just numbers. So is it possible just to say, like, int without the star? You could say int p equals address of x, except I think the compiler gets a little upset and says, well, shouldn't you store that as a pointer? Okay. The reason the compiler wants you to do that is because the kind of operations you do on a pointer are different than what you would do with any other int. And so it wants to help you check, type check, and safety check some operations. So they sort of, you, you definitely could do int p equal address of x, but the compiler would say, hey, what are you doing? That's probably should be a point. So anyway, okay. So I store that, and I, what I would say is that p points to x. p stores the address of x, and <clears throat> if I draw a picture of the memory, p, like x exists in the memory somewhere, and p exists in the memory somewhere, but what p stores is where x exists in the memory, okay? So I guess what I'm gonna get to in a second is you can use the value of p to go to here to find out the value of x. And we draw it in pictures usually with these arrows. And of course, that's just me trying to teach you. Like, there's no fucking arrow, right? Like, it doesn't have any kind of like literal connection. It's literally just a number being stored there, but that number is a place I could go in the memory if I wanted to, right? Okay, so. That's what a pointer is. And I will tell you, students get all mixed up about when do you put an ampersand and when do you put a star or when do I put both of them. And unfortunately, the syntax is kind of hard to remember sometimes, but oh well. Um, so <clears throat> if you want to follow a pointer, if you want to go where the pointer is pointing at and look at the memory <laughs> that's there, you could do that by writing a star in front of the name of the pointer. So it's called the, oh, deference. No, it could it should be the dereference <laughs> operator. The deference operator. No, you go. <laughs> eh? Deference? No, never. Um, <clears throat> well, of course, you just read the slide wrong because it clearly says dereference. Um, anyway, uh, if you put a star in front of the name of a pointer, it means what is pointed at by the pointer. It means go to the memory that's stored in the pointer. So, like, if I say star, if star p equals the address of x, and then I say print p, it'll print the address of x, which is 0, x, 7, 8, whatever. If I say print star p, that means print what is pointed at by p. What is pointed at by p is x. Or it's what's found at that memory, which is that, which is 42. So I, star p prints 42. And I think, what again, what, convinces, what confuses some students is like, you write int star p here when you declare it, but then it's like, wait, do I write a star when I use it or not? Like, it's like, if you want to follow the pointer, then you do write a star. Some students get confused and they write ampersand p. What do you think ampersand p is? Well, it's the memory address of p, so it's like that number. You know what I mean? But that's not a useful thing. I don't care where p is in this memory. And anyway, but you can that's why it's confusing because you can ask for the address of P, but that's not valuable. You want to follow P. Uh, do you have a question? Yes or no? Oh sure, yeah. yeah. Um, what would happen if you put um, the ampersand and then a value instead of variable? If you put ampersand one, two, three, four, five? Uh, that doesn't work because one, two, three, four, five is a literal value and it isn't stored in memory anywhere. Only variables, arrays, things like that take up memory. Yeah, you'd have to write in a variable or something that takes up memory. Like, if you have an array, you could ask for the address of that array bracket four, and it'll point to that. But you can't ask for the address of hello or the address of one, two, three, or whatever. Um, yeah. If you have a pointer to a pointer to something, and you. Point exception. <laughs> pointers to pointers. 
dereference once, but do you reach the, the pointer in the middle or the like integer at the end? Yeah, um, you uh, you can have a pointer to a pointer, and you have to write int star star p2 or whatever equals address of p. You can do it. If you do a star, it follows once. So if oh, it's well. like a pointer to a pointer to a pointer to a pointer, you have to put like star 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 star. star. Um, that's like 107 kind of stuff. We're not going to do that, I don't think. But you can do that. Anyway, look at this, though. If you dereference p, <laughs> um, if you dereference p, it tells you the value of x. It tells you 42. If I say star p equals 99, that means go to the place p points at and put a 99 in there. So I just changed x by walking from p. So that's, that's relevant. Then if I print x, I see 99. So that's like, you can't do this kind of stuff in Java. Um, it doesn't have pointers in Java. You can't really do it. So, okay, that's dereferencing a pointer. Here's a pointer mystery problem. Uh, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I just, I, I suggest you walk through this example later. I, I don't think we need this for what I want to do with linked lists today, but see if you can trace through this code and figure out what the output would be. Keep in mind, I actually also have an int reference in here. Remember references? So that's another use of the stupid ampersand. You, uh, some students would ask, you know, well, what's the difference between a pointer and a reference? They seem kind of similar, because like a reference lets me talk to something in main. It seems like they were sharing the same memory. A pointer points at some memory. It feels pretty similar. Um, pointers are the predecessor of references. Pointers were around before. And pointers are powerful, but they're easier to mess up. They're easier to make bugs. They can do more stuff than references can do, but it's easier to do it wrong. And so lots of people have lots of bugs and lots of code uh, because of pointers. <laughs> and so they invented references that are simpler. It's harder. I bet you guys have occasionally had bugs because of references, but the amount and the kind of bugs that you have had are probably simpler and fewer than the people who write bad pointer code would have. Is there a question in the back? Yeah. Yeah, so if you use dereference and then a pointer to something that your program didn't make, and then you try to reassign the value, is that going to reassign something like random in your memory? Oh, yeah, what if you point to something random? I think I have a slide on that. It's about a garbage pointer. Basically, yeah, you can point to anything, including random numbers somewhere that might have nothing to do with your program, and you can go there and you can try to mess with stuff. And uh, let me show, I think I'll get there in a second. Basically, bad things will probably happen. <laughs> um, let me see if I can get there. Let me, let me talk about null pointers first. Then I think next will be garbage pointer. So you guys have probably heard of null. Most languages have this concept of null. Null means like no uh, object or it doesn't refer to anything. And that's kind of the same idea here. Um, in terms of pointers, null is a, the pointer that points to zero. It's the memory address zero. And so if you store, they call it null pointer. Um, it used to be called no. <laughs> you had to shout to say no in C++ before. Um, both of these work. Both of these work. It's recommended to use this one because the, for some reason the compiler is better at finding checks and errors than if you use that. I think this is literally just an alias for the number zero. And I think this is like a well-typed pointer of zero or something. I don't, I don't remember quite why, but no pointer is the way to say don't point to anything. So there's a star p, point to nothing. If I print p, it prints zero. If I try to print star p, that means go to memory address zero and grab what's there and print it out. There's nothing at memory address zero. It's just a, a bogus address. If your, memory, if your computer tries to go there and tries to reach into there and grab the contents, it causes something called a segmentation <laughs> fault, seg fault. It basically means your program tried to grab memory it's not allowed to look at. Every program has a certain amount of memory it's allowed to look at, a certain amount that it shouldn't look at. Um, so if you try to go to bogus addresses of memory, you will probably crash a program. So when I say kaboom, it means like the program stops and red error message text pops out. So, um, now, you can still set something to null pointer. You can test if something is null. Um, also, I don't know if you can read this far down on the slide, but C++ has this syntax, which you call the kind of truthiness uh, syntax, where if you say like if p, like you do an if statement and the, the test is just a pointer's name, what you're asking is if p isn't null. Or if you say if not p, you're asking if p is null. So like you can use that as a shorthand for instead of writing equals null pointer or doesn't equal null pointer. Yes? Yeah, like how do you know what memory 
MAC addresses are okay to look at. Well, I mean, I'll show you in a minute, but there's syntax where you can request memory. You can say, I want enough memory to store an int. I want enough memory to store a vector. And the computer, will, the, 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 you know, the compiler will then give you that much memory. And you're guaranteed you can use that much. You can look at it. And so I think the, 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 the idea is like, if you want memory and you want to play with memory, you should ask for it. And then once you get it, you have it and you control it. You can do anything you want with that memory. If you ask for a megabyte, you ask for a million bytes or whatever, they'll give you a pointer to the first of the million. And now from there to that plus nine, 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 you can uh, use all of those bytes. But any memory that you never asked for, it's unpredictable whether you are allowed to go mess with it or not. And if you go mess with it, bad stuff can happen. It, it might cause your program to crash. It might cause weird behavior. Basically, you're just randomly reaching in and fiddling with something, and who knows what it could possibly do. Um, uh, yeah, question. So does the program, like, by default, already ask for something? Like... Oh, well, when you start a program, it kind of loads up some memory for main and some stuff like that. So you have some memory that gets used just without you. Also, the C++ standard libraries use some memory for themselves. So like. Even if your program just says hello world and then exits, you get some memory. But I mean, I'll show you more in a second how to like ask for memory. But basically what I'm trying to say is sometimes you want to declare a pointer, but you're not ready to make it point at anything yet for some reason. And if that's the case, you should set it to null pointer. That way, it's, you know, I guess the good thing about null pointer is it's easy to check for. It's a clear like don't point at anything value rather than making up some random number that, that would be digitally above. Yeah. So in that second box over there, even though the memory address is zero, the P itself still is out of the location. Right. And it's given by the text there, right? So, so basically, like, it still exists in memory. Right. So I think one thing, one thing for, for students who are just learning this that can be tricky is, like, just because I set P equals null pointer, that doesn't mean P is at address zero. P is a pointer who exists. And P is stored at some legit memory address. It's just that what he stores is null. He stores zero. He points at null. It's an arrow that's chosen not to point at anything or whatever. But this P, it doesn't mean that P is off at address zero himself or that P doesn't exist or something like that. OK. All right, so that's what a null pointer is. Now, related to that is what is a, oh, null is the blackness of space, I guess. I don't know. Um, then there's a garbage pointer. I think the gentleman's question a minute ago was kind of about that. Now, a garbage pointer is one that points to some random place in the memory. The most likely reason you would have a garbage pointer is that you never initialized it. In the infinite wisdom of the design of C++, they made it so that if you don't initialize a pointer, it stores whatever number. It just stores some random number. And so that random number probably points to some horrible place in the memory that you shouldn't go messing with. So if you try to follow that and print star p, who knows what's there. Sometimes if you write that and run it, it'll just print some number, like 12. And you're like, oh, I guess there's a 12 there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, sometimes it's fine. But you know what's funny? Like, sometimes you go to that memory and you set it to 42 or something. But oops, that was the like return address of the function, and then the function returns to 42 or something. It just does weird things. Like, sometimes you're your, your pointers to garbage, if you mess with the, the memory that's at, at that location, you break the whole program and it messes everything up. And what's most insidious about it is that sometimes, I mean, I wrote kaboom, but sometimes it doesn't go kaboom. Sometimes it just sort of silently goes and tweaks something and never <laughs> tells you. And now your program just has some weird arbitrary change value in it for the rest of its runtime. And that's super hard to debug. So. Uh, my uh, suggestion is never declare a pointer without equaling it to something, even if you just set it to null pointer. It's a lot easier to trace down bugs that way. Somebody's hand was up. Yeah. Can you uh, can you go and modify the memory of other programs running on your system mm, in your yeah. program? Yeah. Good question. What about other programs? Like, I I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this just because I think it's more of a 107 topic, but. Like in the old days, all the programs shared the memory. And so if you jump to the wrong memory address, you were actually messing with another program's memory. So like the browser could mess up your chat program by running the wrong memory address. Nowadays, they use something called virtual addressing, where every program gets its own fake mapping of what memory addresses correspond to what. So technically, no matter what I do, I can't touch other programs' memory. All the memory addresses are fake my addresses. 
but really it maps them to some actual chunk of memory that's mine. And so the OS shelters every program from every other program with this fake layer of abstraction of the memory. But nevertheless, there's still large chunks of the memory that I shouldn't mess with because they're being used by operating system processes or, or other things that, that are talking to my program or just parts of the program that, I, that I'm not in control of. So yeah, you don't have to worry about breaking other programs, but you break your program. Like to edit or restore or modify the data yeah, of another this program? Is a program that wrong, has been wrong and then ended, and we want to see the last data and last part of the memory that has been modified by that mm. program. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to go off topic. So I think the, the short answer to your question is like, as a program runs, it uses some memory, it stores some data in the memory, some values. Then when the program exits, typically all that happens is the operating system marks all that memory as being available. So technically, if some other program came along and grabbed that memory and looked at it, it would still have maybe stuff in it that was sensitive. So some programs zero out their memory in various places before they quit or whatever. There's different things programs do to try to avoid that sort of stuff. Um, we're not going to come even close to that sort of wizardry today, but there are some tricky things, and, and some operating systems nowadays have these uh, protection mechanisms on memory to try to stop programs from looking at memory they're not supposed to look at or whatever, because you get some very sensitive data in your memory. Um, anyway, whatever. Be careful about null pointers. Be careful about garbage pointers. Null is better than garbage, because you can debug it better. So uh, I, I drew the pointer as pointing to some gremlin. Uh, I thought I was being really funny, because I made the pointer point to Dead, you're dead. It's I don't know, whatever, D-E-A-G. Um, so, okay. <laughs> Clearly you liked it just as much as I did. Um, you can make a pointer that points to a struct. The address of a date basically behaves the same. So if you, if you want to, if this pointer points at this date, and you want to print out the month of the date, you'd have to say, you couldn't just say p.month. That wouldn't be right. You'd have to say, go to the memory that he is pointing at, go to the date that he's pointing at, and ask for that doc month. Do you understand? So like, this would be how you would follow the pointer, get to the date, print his month. Since this syntax is so icky, and you would do that a lot in theory, they added a short syntax where you say p arrow month. This syntax is exactly the same as this syntax. What it means is follow p, like star p, and then when you get there, do the dot month on that. That syntax is one that I'll use a lot this week. So I just want you to understand, that arrow means follow the pointer. So like, for example, if p were null, and I tried to say p arrow month, it would be saying, go to null, and there's going to be a date waiting for you there. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of love life, I would say. Um, <laughs> um, and then when you get to there, print the month of that thing. But that would crash. If you had a null pointer and you said, go to the arrow month of that, that would crash, OK? But, um, and if same thing if you wanted to call a method on it. You could say p arrow to string. <coughs> OK, so p is a pointer that points to this, and all the stuff is inside there. Are we good so far? Yeah? Um, OK. Well, now let's talk a little bit about where things get put in the memory. I don't want to talk a ton about this because, again, it's more of a 107 thing. But I want you to feel like you kind of have a sense of what the heck is going on. So I'm going to try to give you a quick version of this. When you run a program, as each function gets launched, it allocates a chunk of memory for that function. And the collection of all those chunks of memory, we call it the call stack or the stack. And I've drawn it as going up, like as a function calls another function, it sort of stacks on another chunk of memory. Now what goes in that chunk of memory? Well, obviously if their function has any local variables like A and B, they would go in there. And actually if you did recursion and you had five calls deep and each of them had local variables, each of them would have memory for each of that copy calls local variables like that, right? Um, I didn't draw it here, but also in that memory, it stores some stuff like when the function is done, where am I supposed to go back to? I'm supposed to go back from G to F or whatever. It stores some stuff like that in this place in the memory as well. I don't really want to draw all the detail of that, but that's kind of that's also going on here. Okay? So the collection of all this memory and what is in it is called the stack. An important thing to know about the stack, I think you know this just from programming, not in a memory sense, but 
when a function is finished, all of its <coughs> local variables fall out of scope, right? So they're all sort of thrown away. We understand that, right? But what it really does is it takes this memory and it wipes it out and goes back to the previous function. And so technically when these variables go away, what's happening is that it's smushing down this call stack and all the memory from those variables is reclaimed. Okay, yeah. So is this call stack, is this like a special thing that, 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 like, that, that like, I guess only the program itself can like manipulate? Like is it a special thing? Well, I mean, it's just memory. So like if I happen to have a pointer that pointed to there, I could follow it and change main's a variable. Even if I was way up high on the call stack, if I had a pointer that stored that memory address, I could follow it and set it to 12, and now main's a would be 12. So but is it possible to like, access the stack yourself? And, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could do these weird, horrible hack things that I don't think I'm gonna do today, where like, you could ask for kind of like, if you're in function g, you could ask for the memory address of d, which is your local variable, and then you can kind of walk around a little and be like, well, where am I? What's around here, you know? <laughs> and like, you could see if there's any other variables around and stuff. And so there's some horrible things you can do where you like intentionally move down and mess with the guy below you's variables, and it's called smashing the stack, and you can, it's, there's some weird cool hack stuff you could do. I don't really want to talk about the dark arts like that, but you know, there's stuff like that that you could do where you're taking advantage of the fact that this is mostly contiguous. Mostly one function gets stored next to the other one and stuff. And again, this is somewhat C++ y because like in Java, there is a stack and this is happening, but you can't like go reach and touch it and you can't get pointers to it in Java. They, they decided this was too dangerous and they stopped letting people do it, but we're in C++ so we can. Um, great, so that's the stack, okay, cool. Now, I wanna talk about another piece of memory which is called the heap, the heap. The heap is another piece of memory that is separate from the call stack. Technically, like, I, again, I don't really want to talk about it, but memory is just a big, long array. Like, it goes from address zero up to address big number n, right? And technically, all it is is that some chunk of it is the stack and some other chunk of it is the heap, and it's all just memory, technically. But conceptually, these are very separate regions of the memory that your program talks to. Now, the heap is a sort of a, uh, a space of memory that people can request chunks of. So the way you request chunks of the heap memory is by writing the word new. You've seen new in Java probably, or Python or whatever. I guess Python doesn't say new, but a lot of languages say new for constructing things. But if, you, if you're in C++, you can make a new int, you can make a new double, you can make a new string, you can make a new anything. And if you say new, you write what type you want to allocate memory for, and then in parentheses or curly braces or whatever, you write what value or values it should be initialized with. And what it returns is a pointer to where in the memory it allocated for that thing. So you could say pointer A equals new in. So what that does is it goes off into this heap, which I'm drawing as a shitty looking cloud here. And somewhere in that memory, it sets aside a chunk that's the size of an int. And it stores a value 42 in there and it sends back, returns back, the memory address where it stored that. So I'm saving that as it pointer A. So on the stack, I have A. The value it stores is an address on this heap, okay? So if I said star A, that would be 42 and so on. Now, the, the main difference here, I mean, you say new to go, to, to go make things on the heap. That's one difference here. The other difference that's kind of important and kind of cool is that the heap is completely unrelated to uh, the stack in terms of things being born and things dying and stuff. So like at the end of main or whatever function created this thing, this variable is not, or this, this uh, thing that's being pointed at does not get cleaned up and thrown out. So like down here in function f, I create a pointer c that points to a new int, 49. So it points to this, or so a new int, 99, stores this. When the function f is done and it returns, this heap memory is not cleaned up. It is left as is. The pointer c, this memory gets cleaned up and thrown away. So it's kind of weird because at that point when f returns, you still have this 99 in here, but there's no pointers that point to it anymore. So it's sort of a lost, orphaned piece of data. We call it a memory leak, but it's a piece of data that is still there. So anyway, this heap gizmo, is a way of allocating memory that will not be reclaimed when your function returns. That's important. We're gonna need that in a second. 
And again, the word new is how you just specify which of these two. If you don't say new, you're going to be using the stack. If you do say new, you're going to be pointing to something on the heap. Yes? When you say that the heap sort of like leaks or disappears or like floats around without pointers, uh, it's only because the stack disappeared, right? But like if you were to somehow grab that address <coughs> somewhere else, uh, that makes it reappear again. Right. Like this pointer to this went away when f returned. But somehow, if I had that address saved somewhere else, or I knew that address somehow, and I followed that, the, this int would still be waiting for me. Okay. Yeah. So it's really just, you know, you, you forgot to write down the directions to go to the party, but the party's still happening, right? If you could, if you could just listen and hear it, maybe you could find your way back there, right? Something like that. Um, yeah, okay. Now, again, like, I don't think you have to think about this that much day to day. Um, you don't have to worry about this very much, but it's going to come in handy when we talk about these linked lists and things. I promise we're, we're doing this for linked lists. There's a reason for all this. Okay? So, the word new, again, the syntax is you write the type that you're allocating and you're making a pointer to it, and you set it to store a new version of that type with the parameters. Now, I showed an example on the last slide where I made a new int. You don't very often do that. Because if you want an int that will live on after your function is done, just return the int, you know? Or have a reference that you, you can, if you have an int and you want to get its value out of the function, there are ways of doing that without this new stuff. But when it comes to objects, it's more common to use this syntax. So what you would do is you'd say date pointer v equals new date. You set the fields, you start using it, whatever. So now in main on the stack, you have a pointer and it points to on the heap, uh, date object, right? And what's cool about that date object is that he can live on longer than the function he's declared in. Now again, you could return an object, you could do that, but objects start getting big and bulky and like returning big bulky things, you have to copy them and stuff, so there's a lot of benefit to this guy having his lifespan not arbitrarily confined to the function he was declared in. Okay? And actually, this syntax right here what does this kind of look like? It kind of looks like Java. Like that's how you create an object in Java. So if you want to have your brain bent a little bit, basically every variable that stores an object in Java is basically a pointer. Like every variable is basically storing the memory address in the heap where Java has created that object. So, oops, oh well. Um, that's why when you have null and you try to call a method on it, you get a null pointer exception, right? Even though Java doesn't have pointers, you can get a null pointer exception. Hmm. Seems like they kept the shittiest part of pointers, but oh well. <laughs> um, way to go, Java. So yeah, that's how you make a new object on the heap. Now again, the pointer to the object is on the stack, but the object himself is on the heap, so those are different things. Okay, so back to this linked list that we were trying to build. The, the aha moment here is that each node should not store another node because that actually doesn't even make sense. Because like if you're a human and your, your mother or father is a human, you don't store them, you just have a way of referring to them. So instead, it stores the memory address of another node. So if I am this first node, my data is this 42, and my next is the memory address of this node. And this guy stores a negative three, and his next is the memory address of this node. And if you keep following star, 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 you could be following those next pointers, and you could visit each node that way. Until you eventually get to the last node in the list, there's no data after that, and so we typically signify this by having the next pointer be null. There's nobody after me, my next is nobody. So that's how you know when you have hit the end of the list. That's the general idea here. You had your hand up in the back, what were you gonna say? How is this better than references? Well, um, I mean, I think the thing about references is you're still referring to things that are like on the stack. So my little stacks and heaps that I drew, you can have references from one function to another, but you're really kind of reaching up and down in the stack from one stack chunk to another stack chunk. And whenever the original function that created the thing that you're referencing goes away, that reference thing goes away too. And this mechanism, you can point to things out on this heap that I'm sort of jumping out of the function call stack world. And so therefore, no particular function terminating will lead to the destruction of the nodes I'm building. So if I build this nice linked list and you want to hand it all around to lots of different parts of your program, 
no one part has the power to like explode the linked list and throw it all away by accidentally returning or something. So it's decoupling automatic reclaiming of memory of things we want to use. So that's kind of the gist of it, I guess. Um, okay, so that's, that's how you make a list node structure. So let me, let me show you how you would do this, actually. Like, if you wanted to make a little list, I've got a tiny little cute creator project. We're not going to write very much code today. But, so what if I want to store the values 42, negative 3, 17, 9? So if I wanted to do that, I mean, of course I could make a vector, an array, and I could bracket 0 equals 42 and bracket 1 equals negative 3. Sure, sure. But if I want to represent that as a linked list, what I could do is I could say list node pointer node 1 equals a new list node. And how, do, how can I say list node? Well, I have a list node.h here in this project that has like a data and a next and stuff. So like I can, it's just the thing on the slide, I just have that. So um, I can make a new list node and I can set his data to be 42, okay? So like this little box is the first piece of data. And then I can say list node star node two is a new list node. And his data is negative three, right? Um, now, where do the links come in on the link list? Well, I could say node one next equals node two. So the next arrow from node one, I want it to point at the node two box. So like node one is this guy, or a pointer to this guy. Node two is a pointer to this guy. So I'm saying, hey, you, make your next point to him. So now the first two boxes look like my picture, basically. OK. So uh, yeah, question. So uh, like, uh, uh, I think before, when you're, when you're initializing objects, uh, you could just uh, use, the, use the curly braces to it. So is it possible to do that when you're using the new? Oh, like the curly brace syntax? Yeah, I guess I could. I mean, what, what people will often do instead to kind of cut the number of lines or whatever is they'll write a little constructor that you can pass a data and a next optionally. So I could say like 42 for the data here and negative three for the data here. And then if I want to say node one next equals node two, what you might do is you might say instead node one next equals a new list node that stores negative three. So then I only have the one variable, but then after him is pointing to the other one. So why don't I have ampersands? Or, right, that's a good question, because usually when you say pointer equals something, you have to say ampersand, address of something. Well, when you say new, new goes and makes a list node over on that heap, and it returns the address of that list node implicitly as a pointer. The new operator returns a pointer already. So when I say equals that, I don't have to say address of that, it's implied. Yeah. So if I wanted to store that 17, I could say, you know, node one, this is where it gets really fun. You could say node one next next equals <laughs> 17. Do you understand? Because it's like node one is a node and then he has a pointer. So make it point at another node. So that's the other node now. Make him have a next pointer that points to another node. So you could, you could make this whole thing next 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 equals uh, nine. And then, oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, this was say next, right? Next, 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 and then one more. <laughs> next, 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 next. What's the one that goes here? Null putter. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that's what that set of lines stores data that conceptually means this. I can't. I can't just say print and make it print that. But I have stored all of those values in some way that, if I wanted to, I could look at them all and print them all out. If I wanted to print the values, I could do like C out node one arrow data endl. And so that would say 42. I didn't say ampersand or whatever. I, when I wrote that arrow on node one, that means follow the pointer. When you get there, you'll be at a little node box. Ask for the dot data out of that box and show it to me. Okay. So I made a little linked list. So, I mean, one thing you might want to ask yourself is like, how would I do various operations on this list? How would I print the list? How would I modify the list? Here's a quick example. What if I wanted to delete this 42 out of the list? I want it to just be these three. How would I do that? 
Do you have a suggestion? Yeah? So right now, node one points at this, and each of these points to the next, the next, the next afterward, right? If I want to get rid of this guy, all I have to do is say, hey, node one, don't point to the 42 anymore. Point to the one after the 42. So what's the one after the 42? It's the next. So if I said <coughs> node one equals node one next, then if I printed node one data, <laughs> Then it prints negative three. And I've essentially deleted that node from the front of the linked list. And you could see maybe now why removing from a linked list is big O of one. I basically just cut that person out of the chain of pointers where I'm not pointing to them anymore. I don't have to shift anybody. Everybody stays where they are. I just point somewhere else and my memory moves on. Um, I'm going to stop here in a second, but I'll take one more question before I do. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if you point past this 42, I no longer have any variable that points at that. I've lost that piece of information. You have to use a command called delete to free up and reclaim that memory. I'll start with that on Wednesday when we resume. So have a great uh, afternoon, and we'll pick up from here Wednesday. Thanks a lot.